episode 15. Welcome to the Live Fit Podcast with your host, Glenn Johnson. Today you will learn techniques for permanent weight loss and improved overall health. Oh yes, it is time once again for the Live Fit Podcast. I am Glenn Johnson and this is episode 15. And I must say, I am thrilled because today I have Dr. Lauren Cordain for an interview. If you don't know the name, he was one of the founding fathers of the Paleolithic eating movement. He wrote several, several articles with Dr. Boyd Eaton, who first kind of discovered the way of eating of the hunter and gatherer. We've also heard the name the caveman diet, the paleo diet. Dr. Cordain has written several books, including one called Paleo Diet for Athletes, and that's been one of the issues that people have had. Uh, endurance athletes say they need a lot of carbohydrates, um, constant eating of carbs and carb loading to continue their sport. But the Paleolithic diet for athletes will show you that you too can eat the way your very ancient ancestors did and still ride a bike or run for long distances. Before we get into the interview with Dr. Cordain, I'd like to give you the answer to last week's question of the week. Should you carb load before a big event? Well, based on what I just said, you're probably getting an idea that I'm going to say no. And although carb loading has shown some benefits, the overall answer I'm going to say, based on my own experience and what I've gleaned off off of Dr. Cordain is, No, you should not carb load, especially right before a race or even 12 hours before a race because it just sets up too much problems with your blood sugar and it really doesn't show as much of a benefit as you might think. I often say that I'm carb loading, but every time I have said it, it's been in jest. I'd like to thank everyone for listening, leaving ratings and reviews on Stitcher and iTunes. It really helps the health of the show. Uh, tremendously. That's what keeps the show up there so people can find it and then more people can listen to it and more and more people can learn how to lift it. Without a further ado, I'd like to move on to my interview with Dr. Lauren Cordain. Okay, so I have on the line today Dr. Lauren Cordain, and he wrote several paleo diet books. Uh, one of which is Paleo Diet for Athletes, and I'm going to talk to him a little bit about that. But first, uh, Dr. Cordain, how are you doing? Pretty good, Glenn. How are you? I'm doing really well. Sitting here in some snowy weather, and you're in Colorado, so you must have some snow too, right? Yeah, it's cold and snowy. Where are you calling from? Portland, Oregon. We had uh, several days of snow, and now we have freezing rain, so it's pretty treacherous outside. Yeah, we saw that on the news. You guys are getting some unexpected snow up there. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I was driving in it yesterday, and it was uh, keep you alert. It definitely kept me on my toes, but it was it was exciting. <laughs> no problems. I used to live up in that area. Oh, really? Yeah, I did. I was I lived in Forest Grove, Oregon, oh, nice. for a couple of years. Nice. Found better pastures in Colorado. Yeah, I was actually up there when I was a graduate student. I was going to optometry school, and. Um, that really wasn't my path in life, so I, I left there, but I really enjoyed my time in Oregon. And, you know, I know Oregon is a, a very, uh, you know, progressive state, and the people that are there are huge uh, advocates of paleo. So uh, I like uh, connecting with the folks up in Portland, and uh, I know you've got a lot of paleo friendly restaurants up there. And uh, Yes, we do. It's a, it's a very cool city. So tell me, how did you get interested in paleo? What was what was what was your uh, your path that led you to where you are now? Well, um, I was always a high school and collegiate athlete, and uh, I ran track at the University of Nevada Reno in the uh, early '70s, and I was always interested in diet and health and trying to figure out what I could do personally to help my performance, and then. Uh, for the next 20 years after that, I was a, a lifeguard at Lake Tahoe, and uh, I uh, experimented with all kinds of diets and, you know, supplements and <clears throat> juicing and what have you, and nothing really seemed to work that well. As a matter of fact, uh, I think I probably hurt my performance back in my 
late 20s and early 30s. Uh, By juicing or just everything you tried? I, well, everything. I was pretty much into, you know, beans and brown rice, kind of the vegan vegetarian thing. And I think mm -hmm. that uh, that potentially has adverse health effects because you end up being shorthanded on so many nutrients, particularly nutrients that you need as an endurance athlete, zinc, iron, uh, vitamin B12, and many others. Also, a, a vegan vegetarian diet is is very high in uh, anti-nutrients. So we eat a lot of legumes and brown rice and whole grains. Uh, not only are you not getting the appropriate nutrients, you're actually doing a little bit of damage to your body by eating those foods on a regular basis. So at the time, you know, this was in the 70s and the 80s, nobody knew about it. And at the time, the healthful diet was thought to be, you know, plant-based, uh, low-fat, high-carb type diet. So my, how things have changed. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, so how did I get into it? Well, I ended up uh, getting my PhD and then uh, taking a job as a professor at Colorado State University. And my research focused on uh, fitness, body composition, health, and, and diet to uh, a degree. And uh, in 1987, I read uh, Boyd Eaton's classic paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Paleo Diet, or the Paleolithic uh, Prescription, or whatever he was calling that paper at the time. Right. And I thought it was just about the best idea I'd ever heard. And uh, I ended up reading everything I could, uh, getting all the cross-references to that paper. And uh, finally, I got up enough courage, and I called Boyd Eaton. He's in uh, Atlanta. And uh, we had a good conversational, nice long talk. I invited him up to CSU, and we eventually started writing papers together because he was really the godfather of this whole concept. And I just kind of looked around. It's like climbing a mountain, and, you know, you're kind of near the top. And that's how things happened. I, I didn't deliberately set out to do paleo. I was just trying to find a a uh, healthier way for me to eat and perform on a personal basis. Then my wife uh, finally convinced me in about 1999 to write a popular book on the idea because all I had written up to that point was just scientific papers. So I wrote a popular book and wrote another one with Joe Friel. You may know his name. He's the, yeah. uh, one of the Olympic triathlete coaches because he and I have known each other for a long, long time. So we wrote a book, and that did fairly well. And then probably about 2009 or 2010, paleo just absolutely took off. And, uh, uh, you know, the whole movement now has become a, a worldwide movement. Clearly, I'm not the only person that's involved. I got on board at an early stage and was, you know, working and writing with the major players. But uh, it, nobody owns it at this point. It's a, it's, it's a public uh, knowledge and everyone's the entire world is moving it forward so uh right. it's been very gratifying for me to see it take on this uh, global uh perspective now so your first book was the paleo diet was titled yep. the paleo diet and then your second one with joe Friel was the paleo answer right uh but no the second one with Friel was the paleo diet for athletes and we actually revised both of those. I published the first one in 2002. It was revised in 2010. Trio and I wrote the uh, Paleo Diet for Athletes in 2005, and we revised it in 2012. Okay, that's when I saw it was in 12 when it first came out. I wasn't uh, aware that it was the second, that it was the revision. Yeah, and then the, the Paleo Answer, that came out in 2012 also. Okay, I have that we one. Wrote Paleo Diet Cookbook in 2010, and then I wrote another book uh, called The Dietary Cure for Acne. Okay, so yeah, you have what? So what's that? Five books you have out that have been doing pretty well. And when I look in the paleo section in the bookstore, I see yours there predominantly, but there are many others there, and I I can't help but wonder what are the difference between yours and some of these other books out there. Is there fundamental differences in the philosophy of what paleo is or what is uh, best for the body? Well, you know, I, I really can't answer that question simply because I haven't read the, there's a plethora of books. I probably 
couple hundred or more, maybe three or four or 500. I don't even know anymore. It's become so huge. Right. Um, but anytime you get that many people involved in a, you know, ideology or a, a way of living, uh, I think that there are some basic ideas here that almost everybody embraces, but clearly not all the details <clears throat> are universally, um, agreed upon it. And that's actually healthy. That's how you move forward is, uh, I think disagreement, uh, is actually healthy and so you don't have all the answers no and, and i think <laughs> it's foolish to to try to say that uh, anybody does you know anybody that that comes on being a quote-unquote charismatic individual with all the answers is probably wrong you probably want to stay away from them so that's really the beauty of this whole concept is i didn't invent it nor did anybody else um what we did is we simply uncovered what was pre-existing so uh, you know, we may have been at the very forefront of this notion going out to, uh, you know, hunter gatherers and, and non westernized people and gathering data and showing what they did and did not eat. Um, but others have added, can add to that. So, uh, you know, that's kind of what we bring to the, the plate is the, the scientific information that uh, uh, we published. In the, through peer review, whereas anybody can get on the internet and say anything they want. Right, right. So you are a true academic. You're taking research from others and putting it together and, and trying it out yourself. Well, not just taking research from others. We're actually um, generating data through uh, empirically based uh, experiments, and some are, are non empirically based. Uh, so, you know, it's a mismatch or a, a mis, uh, you know, um, we're putting it together from a variety of sources, but all of the scientific papers are published in high impact factor peer review uh, journals, mainly nutritional journals and anthropology journals. Okay. So for those people out there listening that are, are not very familiar with paleo, um, can you give a kind of a, an overview of what exactly it entails? Sure. The word paleo means old and it stands for paleolithic which means the Old Stone Age. And the Old Stone Age uh, began with the appearance of stone tools and the fossil record. And that dates back to at least two and a half million years ago. And from that point forward until the agricultural revolution, all humans on the planet uh, existed as hunter or gatherers. And the only food they ate was the food that they could hunt, gather, forage, or fish. And there were no such things really as processed foods or refined foods or <clears throat> most of the modern foods that we eat. So uh, the notion is, is that our genome was shaped during that two and a half million year period. And we haven't changed a whole lot uh, since the advent of agriculture, which was only 10,000 years ago. Although that seems historically remote, it's really only about 300 human generations ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, genetic change, even though 300 generations seems, you know, unfathomably long ago, it really isn't on an evolutionary time scale. For, so for the most part, our genome and our, our bodies are, are relatively similar to our Stone Age ancestors. And accordingly, um, the foods that they ate in their environment are the foods that we are best adapted to. Now, clearly, they had all kinds of environments to live in, and they ate a whole ton of different foods, but the, the Western diet is many standard deviations off even the, the furthest, most extreme hunter-gatherer diet. So the idea, then, is to restore um, the food groups that they would have consumed and try to avoid the ones that they didn't. Obviously, we can't live like hunter-gatherers. We can't all go out and eat wild game and gather up wild plants. Um, but what we can do is when we go to the supermarket or to Whole Foods or farmer's market or wherever you get your food, you can make food choices um, that emulate or mimic the food groups that they ate. And basically the food groups they ate were um, fresh fruits, vegetables of all sorts, um, meat, and uh, fish, seafood, nuts, seeds, what have you. And so those are the, 
that really forms the basic of the contemporary paleo diet is mimicking with modern foods the foods that they ate. And we've actually done analyses. We've done computerized dietary analyses and we've contrasted actual wild plant and animal diets to what you can get at Safeway or what have you. Mm -hmm. And the nutrient characteristics of the diet are, are roughly similar. Now, the big difference is what we don't eat is that in the Western diet, 70% uh, of the calories come from four foods. They come from refined grains, refined sugars, refined vegetable oils, and dairy products. So that's pretty mind-boggling. 70% of your calories, if you're a normal American, every single day come from those four foods. Now, you can mix them up. You can call them a donut, a pizza, a cookie, a cracker, um, ice cream, candy. You can call it whatever you want, but it's uh, a mixture of one of those, one or more of those four foods. So when you get away from those, you take all of those four foods out of your diet because hunter-gatherers rarely or never ate those four foods, and what's left? Fruits, vegetables, meat, fish, seafood, nuts, what have you. And when you eat that and those foods, um, the diet becomes incredibly nutrient-dense. You don't have to worry about taking vitamins or minerals because you get everything you need uh, from those foods. And the nutritional characteristics of the diet start to change. You eat a lot of protein, you eat less carbohydrate. The carbohydrate that you do eat comes from fruits and veggies. And, uh, so recently, in the last oh, five to seven years, scientists have now tested that way of eating, which is called the paleo diet, or however you want to call it, mm -hmm. age caveman, whatever, uh, we've actually tested it experimentally, and it turns out that it uh, is superior to many diets that we thought were healthful. For instance, the Mediterranean diet, low-fat, high-carb diets like what uh, American Heart recommends and, and other groups. Uh, so this turns out to be a kind of a world beater when it's contrasted to many of the other what are thought to be healthful diets. Now, you mentioned fruit a couple of times. Uh, I know some people are recently really down on fruit, and I'm a, a fruit bat from, from way back, and I love fruit. I could eat fruit and nuts all day. Um, but a lot of people are saying, according to evidence, that fruit um, causes liver fat and, and stored body fat. So where do you stand on fruit? Well, you know, people can say whatever they want, as I said, on the, you yeah. know, the Internet. And I, I think that what you'll find if you go to the sources – that most people um, point out is that they're they're not empirically based. There actually have been a couple of studies that have done um, in overweight and even type two diabetics, uh, and where they gave them, um, you know, where you take the entire fruit and you what do you call a fruit fruit puree or a, right? It's not a fruit juice, and they mix all of those up and they give it to them, and then they um, measure what's called insulin sensitivity through. Uh, you glycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp, which is the best way to measure insulin sensitivity. And what they found is that uh, those fruits didn't impair insulin sensitivity. Now, however, I'm open-minded, you know, and maybe our people out there that don't do science are onto something, and, and that's certainly a possibility. They, you know, a lot of good information starts off as anecdotal. And so one of the problems with modern fruit, when you contrast it to wild fruits, uh, is that it tends to be bred for um, uh, low fiber and uh, high, high sweet. It, it's very sweet, yeah, a lot of sugar in it. So <clears throat> uh, not all sugars are the same, and so not all sugars tend to uh, impair insulin metabolism. Fructose is the big one, and that is handled differently in liver. It bypasses a crucial s metabolic step in the liver, um, and that's what causes problems with fructose. So if somebody is grossly overweight or obese or they have the one or more of the diseases of insulin resistant, then I would say that they need to be careful and cautious when they first try the paleo diet. Um, if you go to my website, thepaleodiet.com, we actually list the sugar content of all commonly consumed modern fruits. So you can see how much fructose in, uh, are in fruits. Some hmm. of the bad ones are like apples and uh, uh, not all apples. It, there are different varieties of apples, but the average apple, the average uh, grape is, is pretty high in fructose. 
grapes you can end up eating a ton of. You can sit down and pound. Oh yeah. Pretty easily, but apples. I don't know. Most people, you know, you can eat one apple, maybe two, but you probably can't eat seven or eight. So, you know, I, I think that most fruits are self-limiting, and there's a lot of really healthy fruits that you can eat all you want, and you don't have to worry about it. Believe it or not, tomatoes are fruits, and they have very low sugar content. Same way with lemons and limes. Um, most uh, berries, like what you guys can pick wild up there in Oregon, uh, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, uh, typically are, are low in uh, sugar as are melons. So most cantaloupes and um, you know different varieties of melons are, are quite low in sugar. Except the watermelon, so, I suspect it's pretty high in sugar. Um, you know, that's kind of a myth. And uh, once again, if you go... To my website, you can actually get the data, and so you can see how much sugar. And we actually break it down into the types of sugars. Um, believe it or not, uh, glucose is actually not as harmful for you. Glucose is a monosaccharide or a simple sugar, and it doesn't seem to uh, have nearly the adverse effect that fructose. As I mentioned, fructose uh, is it, just metabolized way differently than other sugars in the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at your page right now on your website. Um, so I, I will definitely give this information in the show notes, your website, and some of these others that we talk about so people can find it more easily. This is very informative. So I, I'll give a direct link to this page in particular. Um, to answer your question, yeah, I, I think that um, you know, normal healthy people who are adopting paleo probably don't have problems with sugar. Some people do. And if you do, listen to your body. This is a starting point. For healthy eating, it's not the end point. Everybody needs to kind of fine-tune it uh, to their own needs. And you were talking about uh, the the thousands and thousands of years that people have been eating a certain way. And uh, years ago, I read a book called The Blood Type Diet. And it does talk about that, but it says that certain regions of the world, as you can imagine, had certain foods available and not other foods. And there was the northern what's now european area they had dairy and so they did not wean from milk when when they were weaned they continued eating dairy and those people their ancestors that are still alive can can eat dairy um but i noticed that uh paleo generally says no dairy most people say no dairy so what's your stance on that is there anything to this blood type thing do you know anything about it yeah we you know i'm I'm a scientist at a division one research institute and what I do all day long is play around with these ideas and read scientific papers. Unfortunately, the, the person who wrote that uh, blood type diet um, actually, I think, did quite well in the popular book market. Um, but it's just, I hate to say it, it's junk science. And so we wrote a, a pretty stern rebut- rebuttal to it. And um, he, he completely got everything wrong. Anybody that wants to take any time and go on Medline or PubMed, you can look it up. And he's got the timelines wrong. He's got um, the blood types wrong when they evolved, when they appeared in the scientific literature. It's a complete and total uh, disservice to the general public. You know, it's kind of like if you're a computer scientist and you try to speak computerese to somebody, they have no clue what you're saying. Yeah. And it takes another scientist to disentangle the, the, real, the reality and the facts. And this thing is an absolute total joke. It's, it's not based in science. If he tried to publish that in any scientific journal in the world, he, he would be completely blown out. It's, none of the facts are even close to being close. Now, you brought up the point about dairy. Well, cows were first domesticated roughly 10,000 years ago, all right? And if you look at certain people in the world, uh, they have the ability to digest milk because it contains a sugar called lactose, and you have to have the the enzyme lactase in your gut. 66% of the world's people can't digest uh, lactose, so consequently they have GI tract upsets when they drink milk. Now, if you go back and look at Peter Dio Demo's blood type diet, well, there, he, there's four different common bloods. First off, he completely gets the whole thing wrong. There's, there's at least 35, 36 different blood types that are common, and there's over 300 different blood types. So does that mean we have to have 300 different diets or 36? 
uh, you know, that's, that's one of the clues. Secondly, uh, he said the most recent is the AB blood group. He said that's the most recently evolved. And he says it only happened roughly 14,000 years ago, or actually 1,300 years ago. That's complete nonsense. That blood group evolved almost 600,000 years ago, wow. two orders of magnitudes higher. So, I mean, just the starting point is ridiculous. And uh, if, if you're interested, you can uh, go to my website, and I think we published a blog. I extensively rebutted him with perhaps, I don't know, 80 or 90 scientific references. And you can read it for yourself and get all the details. So it's somewhere at my website. I, you know, uh, I don't know exactly, but actually if you Google my name with uh, blood type diet, you'll probably come up with that paper. Okay, I, I will look forward and put the, I'll put that in the show notes as well. Yeah, once you find it, and uh, I don't know exactly where it's at, but it's somewhere on my website. Um, another thing I wanted to talk to you about is I spoke with Dr. Barry Sears recently on my show, and and he said that his diet is paleo. Do you agree or disagree? Uh, have any words on that? Yeah, you know, I know Barry. He's a, a colleague and a friend, and I've known him for years, and I think his diet basically, um, you know, follows... Well, first off, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there, there really is no, nobody's eating Stone Age diets. We're all eating contemporary diets that are based on Stone Age food, food groups. So I, I think Barry is, is pretty, you know, he's done a pretty good job of, he, he was one of the pioneers of getting it early on. And, I, I, you know, I don't, I've never really read his books from start to finish, but I've been at conferences where he spoke. And what he advocates is, taking a piece of meat about the size of your fist, putting it on a plate, and then filling up the plate with uh, fruits and veggies, and that should be what you do for your meal. So, right, I right. I think he's on board with it. Except if I recall, he's not uh, fundamentally against grains where you would be. Well, you know, I don't know if he is or he isn't, but uh, uh, we clearly uh, are against grains, and I think – Almost anybody in the contemporary paleo movement that's been around that are blogging, that have written books, um, you know, there's few exceptions. I think some people might say you can try a little bit of rice, but I, I think most people, for the most part, suggest that that's not it. And, and really, you know, what I uh, try to do, uh, Glenn, is use the model of hunter-gatherers. And, you know, hunter-gatherers, rarely or never ate grains. They simply didn't have the technology to make it, and grains weren't, um, you know, edible grains weren't uh, universally widespread across the earth. So uh, it really becomes a moot point once you back up 300 human generations. Is that, uh, and, and even uh, historically studied hunter-gatherers rarely ate grains. They were considered starvation foods. Wow. And um, they're, you consider them to be anti-nutritious, as in they're not just not good for you, but they're bad for you? Well, first off, it's, um, you know, the question that I would ask is why would you want to eat? It's an inferior uh, food. So Price. if you take... Price. It's, they're cheap. Cheap and plentiful. And, and, and actually, nutritionally, they're, they're inferior. If you take um, the 13 vitamins and minerals that are most lacking in the typical U.S. diet or the Western diet, the 13 vitamins and minerals most lacking in the U.S. diet, and you analyze the various food groups, cereal grains end up close to the bottom if you separate foods into one of seven categories. We pointed this out in uh, a couple of scientific papers. We did actually the first analysis showing that uh, cereal grains are nutritional lightweights and uh, high cereal grain diets as I pointed out in my paper, cereal grains, humanity's double-edged sword, actually cause um, nutritional deficiencies. So you may have heard of pellagra. Okay? Pellagra is a disease that ran rapid in the United States in the South in the uh, late uh, 19th century. It also devastated Europe and Italy uh, in the 16th and the 17th century. And it primarily comes from eating corn, so if you eat a ton of corn, mm -hmm. you develop a disease called pellagra. There's another disease if you eat too much rice called beriberi. 
particularly polished rice. Right, right, right. Yeah, pellagra, berry, berry, and also uh, grains don't have any vitamin C, so you get scurvy if you have nothing but but uh, grains to eat. So grains really are, are nutritionally inferior. They're low in the 13 nutrients most lacking in the typical U.S. diet. And then to add insult to injury, as you pointed out, they contain multiple anti-nutrients which interfere with normal human nutrition and potentially can be um, a toxic ranging from lethal toxicity to just mildly toxic. And so that's kind of what um, recent science, particularly people that are studying autoimmunity are now coming to the conclusion is that uh, the anti-nutrients in grains uh, have multiple adverse effects in the GI tract. And if they get past the GI tract, they seem to uh, interact with the immune system. And cause inflammation in joints, too, is that right? Um, you know, that whole series of events, you know, as scientists, you have to go A to B, B to C. You have to do that entire series of events. We've known for a long period of time that elements in grains in animal models can cause inflammation in joints. Whether that translates what we call in vivo, in living humans under normal conditions, hasn't been established via randomized controlled trials. And that's really the gold standard in science is with randomized controlled trials. So realize that this whole paleo diet concept is has only been around, at least in the modern era. Boyd Eaton published the first paper in the England Journal of Medicine, 1985. And the the idea that this thing is, you know, potentially therapeutic, I wrote my first book in 2002, mm-hmm. and the movement really didn't take off until, you know, maybe 2006 to 2009. So uh, science is a little bit slow and behind the, the curve in right. you know, getting this. Yeah, and that's the trouble. Uh, and a lot of people will argue that they they heard it from a friend, they heard it, they read it on on the internet, um, which is <laughs> which always cracks me up. But they say it's they assume it's true just because they heard it. But science really does take quite a while to to show proof of of a certain thing. Popular diets out there over the years. I've been following them since I was probably about 12 years old, and and that's kind of what what brought me into um, my career path where I am now. And it's, it's seeing all these different diet trends come and go and explode and then disappear, and seeing people who are basically um, diet hobbyists. They would they would just jump from one diet to another, looking for that magic cure, that magic bullet. And I find it really uh, uh, inspiring or or interesting also that uh, paleo uh, took took a while to to build and and now it's kind of exploded but it's been around for a while there's there's been some fringe people following it but now there's there's many more people following it uh, and it brings a certain amount of um, I don't know uh, distaste to some people I guess like oh yeah well paleo 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 but at the same time if you if you do follow the the research and the evidence you might see that it that it does have a, a pretty strong foundation. Yeah, you know, I I think that's kind of the point that I've tried to make through this interview is that uh, people should always let the data speak for themselves and try to stay away from any charismatic individuals. You don't have to listen to me. You don't have to listen to Rob Wolf or Mark Sisson or anybody else. Um, But, you know, there are dozens of academicians and scientists out there that are testing certain aspects of this. And, uh, you know, you can read their papers for yourself. So, you know, when, uh, you know, somebody criticizes it and hasn't read, uh, you know, the papers or the, the science behind it, uh, then they're really ill-informed. And so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I didn't invent this. No one invented it. It's, it's really not a, dro- a diet per se. It's a, True. It's a long way of eating to, to optimize health and well-being. And, and who... Who amongst any nutritionist would would tell you that eating, you know, real living foods, fruits and vegetables, uh, seafood and fish, grass-produced meats, you know, will cause adverse health effects? So I I think that, and, and that you shouldn't eat refined sugars and grains and processed foods and candy bars. I mean, that message is, it's a, it's the, 
21st century way of eating, a clean, green, and responsible way of eating. And you bring up a, a, an interesting point. What nutritionists would say that you shouldn't eat those healthy whole foods and and prefer the processed foods. But my problem is as a uh, as an instructor in nutrition, I find a lot of people do eat these processed foods, and and I'm sure that at least seventy percent of most of their diets do consist of it. Um, but the argument always goes down to cost and availability, and so that's the main problem I have is convincing people to eat the whole foods when they can buy a, a case of Top Ramen for the same price as six apples. Well, you know, I, I don't know that I would necessarily agree with that, but uh, you have incredible farmer's markets in Portland, and we have very good farmer's markets here in Colorado. Uh, the unfortunate part is that, you know, the fruits and veggies and, and all that isn't available all year round, but I don't know about in Portland, but here in Colorado, yeah, and I and I only have to travel maybe a mile and a half to get to our farmer's market, and uh, for eight bucks, I can get a uh, about a 20-pound bag of anything that's you know available, whether it's carrots or beets or cabbage or uh, you know onions or what have you, for eight bucks. Nice. So yeah, and so that that happens on a daily basis. They bring these things in, and if you wait till the end of the day, you get them even cheaper. So I, I look at that eight bucks, and then I look at processed foods, things like, uh, you know, Kellogg's Corn Flakes. And what is the box? I don't even know what it costs anymore. But yeah, probably three bucks uh, or something. Yeah, it was between three and five bucks for a box that contains maybe, what, two cents worth of cereal grain? Right. And the rest is for cardboard and advertising. So, and then I look at the, the potential health benefits of eating something like processed corn for breakfast in, you know, a bowl of milk versus having a bowl of fresh fruits and, uh, you know, a piece of meat or fish. So you can buy, and I know there are websites and blogs that help people to do paleo on a budget. So one of the, the tricks is to look for the sales and buy uh, fish and, and meat. Uh, when it comes on sale. So in Portland, you're close to the sea, and you know when the, the seafood comes out and you can get salmon for a really incredible price, you can get a big load of it and freeze it and put it in your freezer. Um, same way as if you can eliminate the middleman by going to farmer's market. That's how my wife and I do it. I can't tell you the last time I ever bought any meat at a supermarket. First off, it's difficult to get uh, grass-produced meat in supermarkets. So we go directly to the middleman, and here in Colorado, we have people that produce uh, uh, grass-fed uh, cows, uh, lambs, you know, free-range chickens, uh, grass-produced bison. And so we typically go out to uh, eastern Colorado and uh, get a half a side of grass-produced beef or half a side of, of bison and bring it back and enter it for you there. and. And the price per pound is uh, about the same, or maybe sometimes even a little bit lower than what you would get at the supermarket. So nice. Uh, that's uh, you know there's there's a variety of techniques, and you know even in a city, it, even if you live in downtown Portland, you can you know grow herbs and and vegetables and little pots and you know. True. True. Kind of, yeah. So there are a variety of ways in which you can come around it and. Um, I think people just feel so much better. It's like, you know, why eat cereal and sugar? Yeah, well, I think we could go on um, back and forth with that argument uh, based on the, the people I've spoken with and, and both of our uh, kind of ideas on the subject. Um, but I would like to uh, get to my last two questions really quick. And the first the, the first of the last is, who is paleo good for? Is it good for absolutely everybody? And and, and I'm going to ask you about your book, uh, Paleo for Athletes, in a second. So I'm assuming that's going to be one of the answers, that paleo is, is at least good for athletes. But is it, is it good for the person who just, just has a sedentary I would, lifestyle? I would, I would turn that question around, and I would say, who is the standard American diet good for? <laughs> good point. No one? <laughs> well, it, you know, uh, if if you're involved in fitness and health, um, you realize that 
uh, roughly two-thirds of all Americans that are adults are either overweight or obese, and 70% or more of the population has one or more symptoms of the metabolic syndrome. So you be the, the judge of that. And uh, I'm not saying that it's entirely diet-related, but if you throw in an exercise component, uh, you probably are pretty close to being there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, so let's get on with your your book, Paleo for Athletes. What? Well, it's what's... not really my book. I, I co-wrote it with Joe Creel, the uh, a past U.S. Olympic triathlete coach. Yeah, I've read a couple of his books too. Um, well, well, what's the difference between eating as an athlete, paleo, and eating just a regular lifestyle for, with paleo? Well, you got to re- recall that Joe is a uh, you know, a triathlete coach primarily, and he's also distant runner and, and bicycling and mountain biking. And so we're primarily talking about endurance athletes. And so what we tried to gear uh, that book for was endurance athletes. And I'm not saying that, that you can't do that diet if you're not an endurance athlete, but uh, one of the factors that endurance athletes need to have is is they, they need to maximize their muscle glycogen content prior to, to competition. And so we talk about ways in which you can train and the way in which you can manipulate diet before and after competition and during training to maximize that. And one of the surprising factors that has come out in the scientific literature is that if you eat less carbohydrate during training, you tend to uh, optimize what are called beta oxidation pathways, pathways that utilize triglyceride rather than carbohydrate. And so when people bonk, when they hit the wall, when they are in a competition, uh, it's usually people that eat carbohydrate all day long. And when the muscle glycogen is uh, eliminated or uh, reduced down to practically nothing, that's what subjectively they feel is the bonk. Yet, uh, what we're finding now is that you can extend that time until you get the bonk if you can increase your utilization of what are called intramuscular triglycerides. So one of the most labile sources of energy and ATP in the muscle are intramuscular triglycerides. And by eating a, a paleo diet when you're training and throughout the week, um, it tends to... Uh, reduce your reliance on carbohydrate during training and increase your reliance on these so-called beta oxidation pathways that utilize intramuscular triglyceride. And the object of the game is to enter competition with maximal stores of intramuscular triglyceride along with maximal stores of glycogen. So that's kind of the science behind it. And we talk about the practical part on, on what you need to know. So uh, all of the references Joe and I have provided at the, the back of each chapter, but that book um, uh, tends to uh, cater to endurance athletes. And there's multiple benefits. The same benefits that people have by consuming paleo diets, you accrue uh, health-wise uh, when you do paleo diets for athletes. And so one of the problems that I'm sure you're well aware of is upper respiratory uh, illnesses that seem to happen with endurance athletes and other athletes. They get everything that comes along during cold season. Mm-hmm. And once you start adopting this way of eating, uh, it tends to uh, optimize factors that are involved in immune function that uh, tend to help you or reduce the incidence of upper respiratory illnesses. You do that, you can train harder. And the same hmm. thing is true is that you can train harder if you finish a workout and you're not completely, if your muscles aren't completely wasted. And so that's really what we're looking at. There, nutritionally, there are con, <clears throat> compounds called branched chain amino acids. And uh, they're found primarily, they're, it's called leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And these, these three amino acids, um, they tend to be anabolic in the post-exercise period. And so they restore and help to build muscle that has been broken down during the workout. And so the paleo diet is incredibly high in branched chain amino acids because uh, we focus on animal products at, uh, you know, virtually all meals. Hmm. Very nice. 
Well, I'm going to have to pick up that book and and read it. And I've I've thumbed through it before and just never I didn't buy it because I didn't have the time to sit down and really read it. And I don't want to just have it taking up space. So I'm not going to pick it up until I really have time to dedicate to it. Um, but that's really what led me to wanting to speak with you is the fact that I'm an endurance athlete and I wanted to know really what's the difference between your version and the old ways of carb loading and and uh, some of these other techniques of, of constant carb ingestion. Yeah, we point out some of the shortcomings of the old way of doing it with grains and sugars and what have you. And and recall, well, I don't, I didn't tell you this yet, but uh, grains are net acid yielding, and uh, one of the ways in which the body has to deal with a, a chronic net metabolic acidosis is it uses glutamine to um, basically help get rid of this these net acid ions that report to the kidney. And so, if you carbohydrate load with cereal grains, which is what the average uh, endurance athlete has been doing for 40 years, then you tend to produce a chronic net metabolic acidosis. And we point that out in our book, and we say that if you carbohydrate load, you're much better off loading with uh, foods that produce a net alkalosis, and that way you don't lose glutamine. Glutamine, uh, high levels of glutamine are uh, associated with overtraining, and so uh, you're draining your body's glutamine stores when you carbohydrate load with grains and sugars. So wait, let me get this right. High levels of glutamine um, happen when you've done long training, and you're depleted, or because I know well, there there are, there are two factors. Is that it's the way in which you measure it. So when glutamine is elevated in the bloodstream, it's an indicator of overtraining, and okay. the reason glutamine is elevated is because it's being sucked out of your body because it's being used by the liver to get rid of the chronic net metabolic acidosis. So one of the ways in which the body gets rid of uh, acid ions is by excreting more ammonia. And okay. it excretes ammonia, the a nitrogen source for ammonia, uh, is glutamine. So the body, when it breaks down muscle in the post-exercise period, there are amino acid stores in the bloodstream. And uh, high levels of glutamine then are indicative of overtraining. And if you're losing those, the glutamine that appears in plasma, then it's being sucked out by the liver to uh, titrate uh, the acidic ions uh, that come from a net metabolic acidosis. If you're interested, you know, more fully in that, you can uh, go to our book, and I've written part of a chapter on that, and at the end of each chapter, we cite the scientific references, and you can read the papers for yourself on Medline. Okay, I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm interested. I've, I've heard of people uh, supplementing with glutamine after a, a long bike ride or race or something, and uh, just kind of want to get a little more information on that for myself. Yeah. So, you know, paleo is a pretty easy way to not have to worry about the details. Just eat bananas and fruit in the post-exercise period or pre-exercise uh, so that you don't have to, you know, eat spaghetti. Isn't that how they typically carbohydrate load is go out and eat a gigantic spaghetti meal before a race? Yeah, yeah. That doesn't quite work for me. Yeah. All right. Well, Glenn, thanks. Uh, you've been a really interesting interview, and uh, you are a sharp guy, and you know your stuff. So uh, I appreciate it, and uh, hopefully you get this message out to your audience. And I certainly will. I, I would really like to thank you for taking the time to come on the show with me. It, it was really an honor to talk with you. I've, I've been really impressed with your books, and you kind of being the, the leader of the whole paleo thing. Um, it, 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 it's nice to hear from the horse's mouth. So uh, get well soon. I hope you're back up on your mountain bike and in no time, and uh, I wish you the best. Hey, Glenn, it's been my honor. Good luck to you as well. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Cordain. Man, what a wealth of knowledge. That guy knows a lot of stuff about nutrition. Um, of course, he does about paleo eating because he's written several books about it and many, 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 many papers. And I'm going to have 
links to the things we spoke about and some others uh, that are on his website that are buried within his website. Also, his website link available on my show notes page, which is, get this, livefitpodcast.com. Hope you can remember that. And now I'd like to give you this week's question of the week. Who is Charles Atlas? Leave comments on the show notes page. Tell me what you know about Charles Atlas. But next week in the next episode of the Live Fit Podcast, I will tell you lots of interesting stuff about Charles Atlas. Until then, have a great day, a great week, and please do your best to live fit. Thanks for listening to the Live Fit Podcast. You can find us at livefitpodcast.com.